proceed, people might be still coming in. Um, but we, we have a bit of time, we just go five minutes over if, if needed. Um, it's actually nice that we have a bit of a more intimate setting now because there's... Um, do we have any French or Dutch speakers in the audience? Anybody who speaks French or Dutch? Great. Would, would you be happy to help me with something? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Because there's... Um, so, um, is everybody enjoying the Congress so far? Everything great? Yes. So, our colleagues have been working really, really hard on this. Actually, two of them have a bit of a headache. They sent me to the pharmacy this morning. I don't speak Dutch. I don't speak French. I should speak French because I've been living here for over a year, but that's another story. In any case, um, one of them um, has a lactose intolerance, and the other one is wondering if tonight at the dinner, if they're taking this medication, if they can have a glass of wine with it, because we've heard the wine is really, really good. But I'm just wondering, uh, I've been looking at it. Um, so that's it. Sorry. Um, who, who, who could help with that? Who could look that up? Could, could somebody just check if it's fine with lactose or with alcohol? <laughs> could you? What, what's your name? Vincent. Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. Where, where are you from? I'm from Belgium. Oh, great. Oh, oh okay. fantastic. So you, 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 you can know both languages. Great. Where's, where's my colleague Juan? Juan? Yeah, if, if, you, if you found it, can you signal my, my colleague? But look how big this thing is. It's really hard to find information there. The actually the text is pretty small. It's only in one language. If you go to like another country on holidays, you can't really find what you're looking for. And this is this is just a painkiller. Now imagine you're a person who's living with a chronic disease who has to take multiple medication. There could be there could be contraindications. You would have to look for many many things in these leaflets. Um, and side effects as well. There's just so many things to look out for. And um, also, just imagine you're getting older, your side is getting a bit worse, and then I, I remember my grandma going with like the, the magnifying glasses over these things, which just really seems a bit archaic if you think about that um, we're doing everything with our phones these days, right? So if you click, um, some of my more technical literate colleagues, they have presentations where they include Slido and people just um, scan a QR code and then they can immediately vote on things. Um, so why does it not exist like as just an app? Why can't you just have an app that you put on your phone, you go to your pharmacy, your pharmacist give you, it gives you the package, you scan the code on the package and it tells you this is this sort of drug, it does that, this is the, the information, this is the, the leaflet of it, this is, those are contraindications, all these sort of things. Um, yeah, why, why don't we just have that? And if we're at it, why not add other features as well? Why can't we have like a digital medicine cabinet where we save all the medications and when we took them and for how long we took them? Because if you go to a doctor, you obviously you don't you can always remember how many different things you've taken or maybe it's it's a month back or something. So you you would have all of that at hand and then let's dream a bit further. Let's think maybe we can even make it happen that. Um, the, the app tells you if this is an original box. Is this box actually produced by the, uh, by the producer that it says it was? Um, or does it tell you it's, it's a counterfeit? Um, and even further, just imagine it could even tell you if there's a battery call, which is super important because you would be just keep taking this drug, not knowing that there has been a battery call. I mean, how often do you see that, that things are recalled um, in like public media. There might be like one or two messages on, on you know, news or something, but often it, it goes unnoticed. So, uh, how does it look? Did you find something out about the, uh, nothing? See, that it would be so much easier with an app. Um, so yeah, let's talk about this. Let's talk about electronic product information. Um, but before we start, um, if you think about such an app that gives you all of these sort of things, um, what, what do you think, how far away would such a thing would be? You think it's more than 20 years? Could you just raise your hand if you think it's more than 20 years away? More than 10 years? More than five years? More than three? More than two? One year? End of this year? Oh, wow. <laughs> You're a bit too enthusiastic, I'm sorry. But um, yeah, we're actually, we're not that far away. Um, 
And I'm really happy to present on this topic. Um, and I, I want to give you, or we want to give you an overview of, of all the perspectives on it. So we would like to get you to know what is electronic product information, how would it work, um, and how does it benefit you as a patient, um, and also what are the limitations, what are the risks on it. Um, we will also hear about the current regulatory framework that has been developed uh, within the European Union, and then we want to hear about what do practitioners actually expect from it and how it will work. And then lastly, of course, we want to know what do patients expect from such an app or from electronic product information in general. So really we want you to experience this from all perspectives and then we will give you also room to ask your questions. And for this topic today, I'm, I'm really happy to have here today Juan Garcia Borgos from the uh, EMA who will give you an overview of the regulatory aspects. And uh, we have Ken Firsby, um, from MSD, who is present, uh, representing the Pharma Ledger project, who also have a booth downstairs if you want to go and know more about this. Uh, it's a project on blockchain-enabled healthcare, who will actually show you how such an app could look like. So he has a prototype with him today. Um, and then Junila Gabrani will tell us about what healthcare practitioners um, expect from, from such an app. We will go into a short break afterwards, um, and then uh, we're going into a moderated panel discussion which uh, I'm happy to kick off with Steve Burke, who is uh, one of the patient representatives at the Pharma Ledger project. And we will really see how can we get into a world where EPI is a reality and where it, where it is the frequently adopted practice. Um, but just to give you a, a very, very short introduction, maybe to take a step back, because um, if we think about electronic product information, we should, it, it all sounds very great, but maybe let's take a step back and think about um, what, do we, what do we actually know about how paper leaflets work? How do people interact with them and what actually needs to improve and what can EPI do to improve that? Um, like I already said and how we just saw, leaflets contain a lot of information. So we need to know how do people interact with them? What do they read? So what we've learned so far is that some people, they read the full thing, some people look for very specific things, and others, they just you know, throw them away and don't look at them at all. So we need to have a, a better understanding of how uh, our patients interact with it in general. And also what is important to different, uh, different individuals. Um, our colleagues at PFMD um, did a study on, on paper leaflets and they got uh, 1,029 complete answers. Those are only the, uh, the demographics of it. I just want to show you that it's, that it's not representative of the world or a specific groups. So this was mostly conducted in North America and Europe, so it's very Western-centric, um, and a majority of the participants were females, and we're looking at patients uh, mostly with chronic conditions, so just for context. And they asked some very simple questions, such as, is the paper information people easy to understand? You can see here, the 63% 63.5% uh, actually said, yes, it's, it's easy to understand. Which is very strange, because if you look at this over here, they say 72% say the technical language is, is hard to understand, it's too long, there's too much info, the text in general is too long, or the font is too small. Now, a too small font is something that we could solve easily with an EPI app because we could simply zoom in, right? Um, but what is, what is very important here, and this will feed into our discussion later on, is if you look um, at, at these numbers. So they basically show you um, the preferences whether people would like to have printed documents or electronic documents. And you can see for over 70 years old people, there's like nearly 90% who prefer actually the paper leaflet. And you, you see that this starts already at the group with uh, 40 year olds. And even in the group from 30 to 39 year olds, um, the main preference is the printed document. So um, how do we get to a point where people actually know how to interact with an electronic, um, with electronic product information or an electronic leaflet, um, and what do we need to think about when um, we're moving over from maybe a paper leaflet to electronic product information, and at what point can we actually stop having the paper information next to it? Um, so luckily, there is an app for it, um, which is being developed within the Pharmaledger Consortium. I'm sure there are more, but this is the one that we'll be talking about today. And as I said, uh, our colleague Ken, he has a prototype for that, and um, we will show you a little bit how we involve patients in the development of that app, and then just how it looks and feels like. Oh, that logo is coming back. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've, I've also been looking a bit into the research that exists um, 
into, and actually, um, I must apologize, the, the headline here is wrong. This is actually research on electronic product information. Um, but there have been a few studies, one that had been conducted um, in Hong Kong, I believe, where they asked about a dozen pharmacists, so this is really not representative at all, but um, they found they were, they were hopeful for the benefits, but the evidence is very thin. So people say, or pharmacists say, well, it, it sounds very nice, but we, we can't really imagine it in, in practice yet. And then in, back in 2014, there was a study conducted in Sweden where 41% of the surveyed patients reported positive attitudes toward an electronic form of an e-leaflet. So we can see there are, there are people thinking, okay, it's, it's interesting, but, but where is it going and how does it look like in practice? Now, another study in Finland from 2020 um, showed that users of medicine generally feel positive about an e-leaflet. So this is already 63% who say, okay, this is, this is something I would use. Um, many, so 75% say they are open to the idea at least. And most of the people, really the majority, 88% said they could see positives using an electronic leaflet. So there seem to be a lot of um, positives connected to it, but we really still need to get there. And there, there needs to be more, more research on it. Um, but also we're, we're already at a stage, and Juan will talk about this, um, where Ima has already outlined key principles for EPI in medicines and an EU common standard. And um, if we think back to the presentation that we've seen this morning by Peter Capitain, who said, you know, the regulations are in place for many things, we just need to do it. I think that really points towards uh, exactly what he said there. Um, but let's go into details. So just as a recap, what you will hear about today, we will now have Juan who will show you the regulatory framework that has been developed for EPI. We will then see from Ken um, how an EPI app looks like in practice, and then Junila will tell us a bit more about what healthcare practitioners think about it, and then we will go into a very uh, interesting panel discussion that I'm very much looking forward to, and that you all can contribute to with your questions. And um, with that, I would ask my colleague, the other Juan, to switch to the slides, um, and I call you, Juan, <laughs> to the stage for the presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank uh, EPA very much for the kind invitation, but also to, to program a discussion on electronic product information, which is something which, uh, as you have said, we have given a priority, and that we are actively dedicating resources in a moment where resources are very scarce, in the moment where we just come out of the pandemic, where everything has been devoted to the pandemic and we managed to uh, still keep this as a priority because the network believes is an important initiative which needs to be progressed as soon as possible. So I will try to, um, to give a background presentation of uh, where we come from, why regulators consider EPI, electronic product information, is, is relevant, is important, and which is a little bit the regulatory framework which is uh, supporting this development. And I think already has been said and we live in a society which I think has never been dominated by information as, as, as we are currently. I think we consume information in a way that I think is quite unprecedented in history. Everyone is reading news at speed or in contact with families, friends, or professional relations, going through massive amounts of information as never before. And this is mainly because of electronic products formats facilitates that we are in contact with everyone simultaneously in parallel, which even there are health risks associated to that which are emerging more and more, but it's a reality. It's the reality as now we all work, now we all live. And, and therefore I think information on medicines, which is a crucial piece of information for patients, but for citizens, because everyone is potentially a patient or will be sooner or later a patient, needs to also see how this is adapted to the reality. I think considering what's going on and the way we are living, thinking that product information, information on the medicine that everybody uses every day, can continue to be provided in paper or PDF formats, I think is not possible. So uh, we have been trying to uh, promote the benefits or the needs to transfer to electronic product information in the previous years. But I think this is no longer necessary because the reality is here. The reality is that we need to see how to transport, how to, 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 um, 
to adapt to this as soon as possible and how to make it in a way which works for all the parties, for patients, for healthcare professionals, for authorities, and for everyone. So um, I will try to go back in history how this, this project came up for EMA, for the European Medicines Agency and the regulators. And uh, there was an action plan, but it was based on a European Commission recommendation. We highlighted the need to include product information. And I think let's not try to hide that the, the, the current product information is being challenged by everyone so that we have seen an example how complex, how difficult it is to access to the information contained, especially when we come to a multilingual package, and that it needs to be improved in many ways. There are some deficiencies which were identified by the Commission a few years ago, and there were a set of recommendations that we came up and an action plan that we defined in order to try to improve the information. Uh, in this action plan, and I think this is an issue which comes very often, uh, one of the medications and asthma. I mean, electronic product information will allow immediately maybe to go to the section of take your medicine immediately in your app or on your phone and be able to download the video which will immediately remind that. It will be easier and no need to go through the papers, etc., which maybe they don't have the, the leaflet that have. Another case, we have seen it with the vaccines, with the COVID-19 vaccines. You know the COVID-19 vaccines were approved at the time record, but then some of the information was coming up, and then immediately there was new data, and then the vaccine was extended to a younger population. Therefore, we needed to update the product information. But then there was a new safety concern which appeared as the vaccine was used, and we needed to update the product information to warn the people about this, this issue and to uh, give recommendations how to manage it. And then there was a change in the self life of the vaccine. So there were changes almost, almost every week. There is no paper which can support this change. And there is no way that the patient or the citizen in this case, which is taking the vaccine, has access to the latest version of the product information, which they have the right to know before getting the vaccine. So electronic formats will be able to ensure that at the time of your vaccination, you could access the whole product information and the latest version. But this is happening more and more with all medicine. The pharmacovigilance systems are more and more sophisticated, and the safety changes to the product information are more and more frequent now than it was maybe 20 years ago. It means that some of the papers that your medicines have were printed two years ago. So you cannot expect, you cannot be reassured you're reading the latest version, while electronic versions will allow you to ensure that immediately, as a safety issue is known and it goes to the side effects of the medicine is immediately updated in the electronic version. So it's safer for patients to get access to an electronic version. Another example would be, for example, a, a person who is uh, planning a pregnancy and there is also, uh, in addition, uh, intolerance to uh, lactose. So they want to maybe make a search and they can use electronic information to plan treatment according to those situations you want to get pregnant, and at the same time you have this intolerance. So you immediately can rule out certain medicines which should maybe be careful or should not even take, and then you can do that in, in, in a faster way. And then another case is the element of shortages, and this has been highlighted very much. Shortages of medicines is becoming a, a critical issue, becoming more and more um, a problem in many ways, in many countries, and one of the problems to really try to mitigate that, take measures to, to mitigate these issues is the fact that maybe late leaflets are not available in the language where it's going to be used. And this takes time and money. I mean, sometimes even companies or generic companies are not, let's say it's not worth for them to really invest in changing these leaflets for a generic which maybe is going to be distributed in, small, in a small country. So having this electronically available in all languages could allow immediate switch and could facilitate the redistribution and the importation of medicines through, through the, in different countries. So, for regulators and authorities, again, the element of the shortage, it also facilitates for us because all the administrative elements are simplified by having the, the product information electronically available in different languages. Sometimes there are changes which affect multiple product information, even multiple therapeutic class, for example. This would allow immediately to update this product information. And 
finally, signals. Signals are uh, new information on safety, on the medicine, and it doesn't mean it's a risk, but it's something that authorities need to look whether to define whether this is a risk or not. So product information will allow a better validation, a better, let's say, the first steps in order to decide whether there is a need to do something else. So there, there, these are just a few of them, but there are many examples by which we can illustrate all the data. So where we are now in the project? We have started last year, in 2021, what we call the SETA project. And the SETA project, the main objective was to define this standard. And this standard was adopted on the 22nd of September following a workshop, public consultation, discussion with the stakeholders, discussion with the developers, with industry, uh, and with all member states. So this was adopted by all member states, by the Commission, and by EMA, and again, after consultation with all the uh, stakeholders, and where industry and developers confront the standard. So we have now a standard in Europe, and this is the basis upon which we are going to build EPI. At the same time, we made some kind of proof of concept, we made some kind of demo in this workshop where we saw how EPI would look. And then, of course, we defined some uh, next steps as part of a roadmap, looking at the future and looking at the next steps. So this roadmap implies that now, this year, we are entering in a pilot project. And the pilot project will be to develop a business tool. It will no longer be a prototype, it will be the real business tool which will be used to generate broad information. And we will test it in a few medicines, uh, which we call Fentral of Rice, which is medicines evaluated through EMA. The European Medicines Agency was created in 1995. So all medicines which were approved before are approved what we call national authorized medicines. They were authorized in the different member states. So we will also include these medicines as part of the pilot. There are a few member states which will participate in the pilot. And the reasons were because we want EPI not only to apply to medicines evaluated by EMA initially, if not all medicines in the European Union. Therefore, it's important that we go through these uh, uh, two types. Medicines are authorized centrally and medicines are authorized only in member states. So we will pilot this in a few medicines and the pilot will happen in 2023. So this year we'll focus on developing the tool and then next year we'll go ahead and pilot it with the different this will be a real example, it will not be a prototype. So hopefully next year we can show how it is. And what it is available then, and I think it links to the next presentation, is up to um, third parties, like the project that uh, I my, um, is, 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 is working on in developing apps, in developing any, any way by which this information can be uh, used, developed, disseminated, and promoted to be used by patients and health it is important to mention that, because this is the future, the future is that EPI will be integrated in the assessment process. But because of this flexibility of implementation, during these pilot phases, it will not be integrated fully in the assessment process. It will only appear when the medicine has been approved. This, this is what will, that will facilitate that even if not all countries are still participating in the pilot, we will still be able to provide to patients the final product, the medicine one is approved in electronic format. But in the future, then we will switch and we will integrate EPI in through the whole assessment process, which is more efficient for us as regulators. So I hope that this gives uh, an overview and I will be happy to take further questions or now, whatever is, uh, but we have a few minutes to do that. Thank you very much. slides oh there they are fantastic okay so uh, hello everyone my name is Ken Thursby I'm uh, representing Pharma Ledger today and um, it's my job to be perspective of a, um, an app developer and I've got a really cool demo to show you a little bit later on as well so okay I think uh, Hannah's showed how uh, how troublesome the pain relief 
uh, can be. And there's a, there's a picture there um, of a person hidden behind one. Um, these things are unwielding. We've talked about some of the challenges uh, which we know of today. Um, but how do we go about solving that? Uh, what, what, what's the best way? And we think, our farm ledger, the best place to start is with the patient. Because if we as developers come up with something that the patient doesn't value, then we've been busy fools wasting our time. So if the patient values it, that's success for us. So what does a good EPI look like? Um, there's uh, lots of ideas that were just uh, shown by Juan earlier. Um, we think it starts with understanding the patient journey and then also recognising that the technology is not a silver bullet to solve all, all the problems, but we want to identify where we can make a difference and um, work on that. So I, I think good development of, a, of an electronic product is in building prototypes and testing it, getting input and then getting a better product, going through cycles like that, which is what we set out to do. So the, the way we did this, uh, we, we, we created a patient advisory group. Uh, we got a small group of patients with chronic illnesses. Um, there was only eight. So eight is not a big sample size, but what it did allow us to do is get a really deep understanding, have a really rich discussion about what's important uh, to the patient. Um, and we did this over a series of workshops, um, which were very interactive. On day one, this was all about discovery. So we, we just said, how does a patient uh, interact with the leaflet? From, from the moment you're diagnosed with a health condition, going to the pharmacy to get the prescription filled and then living with your medicine, what does that look like? So we weren't even talking about EPI on the first day. It was just about the, the, the current state. Uh, day two was about ideation. And uh, we got lots of good ideas about what could be in an EPI. I'll, I'll give you a little sneak preview of that shortly. Um, and then day three was about doing these mock-ups, right? These, uh, they call them wireframes. So this takes the ideas and very quickly gives some feedback to patients what it looks like. Of course, when you ask for feedback, <laughs> you get two things, right? You either get some positive feedback, which is nice, and then you get some constructive feedback where you haven't got it right. And that is so valuable because that lets us then say, all right, um, what about this? Does this need it? So it's a very, very much an iterative process. So this is not an eye test, I promise you. I just want to show you this is a long list of ideas that come from the second day with the patients. Um, there was lots of ideas. And these were all ideas about EPI, so all, all the kind of things that patients would value over and above the paper. And uh, this was quite a surprise. Obviously, uh, as developers, we can't do everything at once. So we chose, uh, we chose a, a, a few of the top ideas. The patients voted on these and we decided to uh, use those ideas to develop the first prototype. All right, so this is what it looks like. Uh, there's some nice uh, pictures of the app here that we built. Uh, but I, I always think it's good to talk about, not features, but benefits. Like what, what do the patients get from this? So what, what patients told us, uh, they wanted user-friendly information. So being able to easily find whether you can take the product with wine, <laughs> um, you know, to, to find the right language for multilingual packs very, very quickly, uh, they, they wanted that. Um, and to get it directly, you know, it, it can be quite inconvenient to go somewhere and then have to search and search. There's often some odd names for pharmaceutical products. It can be quite challenging to find the right one. Um, the, the concept of the medicine cabinet, uh, you know, if you're a chronic patient and you've got many meds, having those retained on your phone if you need them, if you're visiting a healthcare practitioner, you can show what meds you're on and refer to them as you need. And um, safety is, is another really important factor. And uh, I, I've got a confession, uh, you'll have to bear with me here. I'm a barcode nerd. 
Now, what does that mean? <laughs> On every pack of European medicines, as David will see from the back, I know, there's a little square barcode. And that barcode is unique to every single package that's available in Europe. And within that barcode is what that, it's what we would call the digital key. It allows you to do a whole host of things. You can get the leaflet uh, through the code in this pack, uh, through the product code. And it also has the expiration date, so you can give an expiration notice if you scan it. There's a batch number, so you can do batch recall. Um, and there's a serial number in there. Now, in Europe, of course, we have the falsified medicines directive. Uh, pharmacists scan this code today to make sure, make sure your medicine is authentic. Uh, but in some nations, that doesn't exist. So there's, uh, I know we're talking about Europe here, but in some African countries where they don't have this system, this could be a very, very powerful barcode for improving public health. So, uh, feature, uh, what else could we do? Some of the features we're playing with uh, at the moment, using this barcode, right? Uh, what about an adherence reminder? You could opt into this. So, if, you, if you've got a number of medicines and you, you need to take it by uh, the doses at certain times in order to get the therapeutic benefit, we could uh, offer that. And um, we could also do things like videos like Juan was talking. So there's a lot of possibility, uh, not just with electronic, but to use this digital key that the industry has already invested hundreds of millions of euros in. Okay, I'm gonna do a demo now. So this is the high risk part of, of my presentation, because when the tech guy stands up and tries to do the tech thing and it doesn't work, it's quite embarrassing. So let's see if it works. Hey. <laughs> All right, we're in business. So, um, so this, is a, uh, this is a mock Belgian pack. Okay, see, we're in Belgium today. So, how might the patient experience be? So, I'm going to open my camera. And here's my, hopefully you can see this through the camera, here's, here's my medicine. And if I look at that barcode I mentioned, nothing happens. Why is that? Well, this code, it's readable in pharmacies, but it's not readable by a native camera on your phone yet. But we've got a solution for that. Through the pandemic, We've all been scanning QR codes, right? Whether it's to get a menu in a restaurant or whether it's to get a cinema ticket. Um, so we can use that to direct you to a scanner, uh, a barcode reader, which allows you to then scan the barcode that's already on the pack, that uniquely identifies this pack, the one in your hand, to give you the right information. And there's a little, there's a little graphic there to tell you how it's done. So I'm gonna scan the 2D code. We'll see what we get back, all right? Yep, you can use my camera. Okay. Ah, language missing. So this is a Belgian pack, right? And I'm from the UK. So the, the app has recognized that my setting is in English, um, but this is a Belgian pack, and this one is available in three languages, okay? So it's given me the option, German, French, or Dutch. So I'm gonna pick the French one and then I get the leaflet. So the idea here, it's all structured. Uh, so you don't need to look through that long list. Uh, my French is not so good, but I think four is side effects. So you can click on that and then find, uh, and as if you can take the product with wine, okay? Um, so you can see that it's, it's product A. Uh, this would work with any product in, from any manufacturer. So you've got the convenience in your hand as a patient to scan anything. So let's scan another one. Uh, I've got a few samples here. Okay, so here's another one. We'll scan again. Okay. So actually, before I scan, can you see the expiration date there? It says 02 2022. All right. So February 2022, this is expired. I scan the code, 
It comes back with the same language message because this is a, a Belgian path ruled, ruled up by French again. And then it tells me that this is expired. So this is important for patients, we think, because if the medicine is expired, you're not going to get the full therapeutic benefit of it because uh, they have a shelf life. They don't last forever. All right, uh, last one. Uh, just to show you how it could work for other manufacturers. So here's another box. This is from another company. Let's scan again. Okay, so if you remember, the last one was product C, um, another Belgian pack. This one's product, sorry, the last one was product A, this is product C. So it, it's just to show you the, the look and feel of the, of the leaflet. It's the same, it's the same structure. So this really builds on the work that um, Juan has been doing in the EMA to get the standard. So the idea is if you're a patient, no matter where in Europe you're taking the med, it would look and feel the same way. Um, you would have the same way of scanning. So uh, th this is a little uh, view of how it could work. I want to show you one other thing. Uh, and this is the concept of the uh, medicine cabinet. That's just loading again. So here's an, another version. This is, a, this is an older version. Let's see if it's working. Yeah. So you asked the question, Hannes, how many, will it be 20 years, 10 years, five years? That you can do a medicine cabinet now. With the scan on these, uh, with these barcodes, um, the, the PI can be retained on your phone for future reference. Um, so this is an example showing some images so you can quickly find what you're looking for. So that's a very quick demo. Uh, thank you very much. Western countries, uh, 
which has been conducted um, surveys on the level of acceptance and the readiness of the pharmacists or providers to switch between uh, the traditional left lead to the uh, electronic product information. 90% in a survey conducted in Belgium agreed to complete the switch from the paper to electronic product version. And also 55% of the pharmacists used only electronic package leaflets in their daily practice. In the United States and also in Portugal, but also in Hong Kong, um, the surveys tell that the pharmacists' overall, overall perception on switching from the traditional leaflet to uh, the electronic version is positive, either generally supportive or strongly supportive. What do they use it for? Information about dosage, methods of administration, indications and adverse effects of drugs. What are the motivators? What are the strengths of the electronic product information? Of course, uh, the colleagues mentioned earlier and I don't want to repeat, but maybe I can echo some of them very, very briefly. Open access to information, enable retrieval of the most updated information because you don't find always the updated information in the leaflet in the traditional one. Also ba better patient access to product information and the speed up of the communication process regarding the new safety information to stakeholders. Also uh, something interesting is the fact that you can find different brands of the same drug as information. This is provided by the electronic form, but not necessarily from the uh, traditional leaflet. Of course, fewer costs of printing for a package leaflet and uh, speed up implementation of a new indication and also providers mentioned uh, a friendly environment. How about hinders and barriers? What can uh, hinder the implementation of the electronic product information? Digital literacy, it's an issue which has to be taken into account because um, it's about patients, but it's also about providers if they encounter population which has a low digital literacy. Patients tend to do what they used to do, which means that it's really difficult sometimes to um, change mentality of a population, change mentality of patient to switch also from, but not just patients, also providers. It's technology dependent, so it might be relevant and then creates interconnectivity, but still, in a case of disaster, you need a backup plan, which means that you still will use the traditional leaflet. One of the barriers that was mentioned of information. This is a point that I actually needed to go back, actually. Clarity of information was also found in many of the studies, which means that healthcare providers, pharmacists, healthcare professionals, find the clarity of information as a concerning point, which means that uh, it's difficult um, for them to, to access the right amount of information in the digital platform. Of course, other procedural barriers are considered to cyber uh, attacking or the high cost of maintaining electronic product information system. How about the interview with Ms. Alesh? How about the interview with the member of the advisory group? Alesh uh, advised me to um, communicate to you that it's about patient empowerment and it's about giving a tool or a service to these patients to empower their own and to make decision, uh, informed decisions about their health. If we give them the tool, we give them the paper leaflet. If we give them the service, then we give them the electronic product information. We can uh, take advantage of both of them. We can take advantage of the electronic form and uh, as a dynamic and as an interactive platform, but at the same time, uh, we have a backup plan, so sooner or later we need to also rely in a combined uh, way of having electronic product information from one side, but also making sure that we have a backup plan in 
case of distractions. So that's, um, from the public health perspective, uh, there are a lot of points that can be mentioned, but there is also a game at this perspective, especially uh, because public health expert can retrieve information more suitably and intuitively and use it for science. Uh, again, from the public health perspective, um, people in general will um, be empowered through health literacy and uh, through the interaction with their providers with digital platforms. This, again, will increase patient autonomy. Uh, in case of the chronic disease, patients, but also providers do not read the leaflet anymore. With the electronic product information, an alert could give them a hint, for example, for a significant update to the leaflet. Of course, um, as, pay, as uh, the colleagues mentioned, there is risk that this might not be beneficial if only for a certain type of drugs or medicine, uh, electronic product information will be available. It should be available for um, a critical mass of um, medical products in order to be beneficial. Again, um, from the modest and work in progress research study that I have conducted in this couple of days, um, there is hints, there are hints that providers are very supportive or generally supportive to the switch from the paper leaf to the electronic product information system. But um, this should also make sure that we can equip and then empower um, citizens with digital information tools. And we also need to make sure that uh, we engage citizens in this process. So um, we, we've run a little bit over time, but I think that's fine. Um, would anybody need a short break? Or would people be fine if we just moved into the panel discussion right away? Anybody need a break? Don't, don't be shy. You're all good? Then, then I would invite all of you on stage, again, <laughs> um, to go into our panel discussion. So, um, while well, I open the questions on my, my tablet here, um, you might have noticed that um, one perspective um, has been missing so far, which uh, is the patient perspective. Um, and why is that? Well, um, because there's not too much data on it. So Geneva gave us a bit of an insight. I showed you a few studies that have been there, but really this is also in development and we, we need to figure out um, what patients actually um, think about it um, and how they engage with it. And um, I'm happy to introduce you to Steve Burke, who is working with us on the Pharma Ledger project. Um, and he's coordinating the group of patients that Ken told you about, um, who've been engaged with the development of the electronic product information app. Um, and maybe to kick off Steve, do you want to Quickly introduce yourself and let us know from, from your perspective and what you've learned from the interaction with the patient group. What do you think are really the, the key, or maybe this is a bit of wrap up, and maybe the, the key benefits and barriers and what, what patients are concerned with um, in terms of electronic product information? Sure. Thanks. I'm uh, delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be representing what is a really involved and engaged patient expert group. And it's with the collaboration as well with. Um, Oriana Costa, who has been supporting me in this role and really doing a fantastic job. So being a patient can often be extremely fatiguing. It can often be quite, um, you know, difficult because you're struck. And I don't talk about the journey because the journey is something that you buy a ticket for. So it's a pathway, yeah? And as you navigate that pathway, you have different questions, you have different expectations you search for information at different points in time and try and understand. And oftentimes your drug treatment is something that's prescribed to you. It's not something that you have a decision around. And when we think about
have something like an electronic format. My, org my company is called Personal Pulse, and we're about empowering people who are patients. And that vision of empowerment means that people actually can take ownership. And you can only really take ownership when you begin to understand. And for an awful lot of patients, a product information sheet is not a way to understand a therapy. It's not conducive to gaining knowledge. It was designed with a regulatory mindset, and there was good reason as to why that was there. But it is not human-centric. And managing a disease on a daily basis is a human experience. And so at certain stages, you would require to access that information. And so what we saw with our patient advisory groups is that they would all access the information at different times in different ways, depending on where they were in their path. Someone who gets a diagnosis on the very first day, they're going to look at therapy in a completely different manner to someone who's an expert, patient expert, who's been living and discussing disease treatment, access to treatment for many, many, many years. That doesn't mean that they don't need different, they don't need knowledge to manage their disease. They need different knowledge at different times. What we've seen as well is that this allows people to have conversations outside of just the time when they're with their clinician, when they're with their pharmacist. They can actually access data at a different time when they need it. And so that's sometimes really important. We see that patients have open forums and open discussions around therapies, and you know whether that's regulated or not regulated, that's happening actively. So what data, what, what patients, people who are patients are looking for is correct information. They want accurate information. They don't want snake oil salesmen. And yes, they want to understand what is the input, what's going to happen in this treatment. So there's all those things around trust, and trust comes through empowerment, and empowerment comes through being able to learn. And learning comes through actually understanding how individuals want to learn. And disease is, it dehumanizes people. So anything we can do to make tools that give back time, to make people feel more human again, and what patients really want, and what we've seen from this, is it gives them back time, but it also gives back time to their professionals. They can address questions directly to them that they maybe don't have at that time, at the moment when they're seeing them. So there's a lot of value to these digital tools. What's critical and what I've seen as, has been really useful in the pharma ledger experience is that you needed to understand what my lived experience of a wide variety of patients of how they would interact at different times with that information. All too often, solutions are provided to individuals that are dreamt up in the idea of, ah, oh, well, I know what you need best. That's not the reality for many people because they don't have the lived experience. Assumption makes a fool of you and I. Don't assume that you understand. If we take two extreme groups, children who are living with disease and elderly people who are living with disease, they may both have the same therapy, but how they're going to interact and discuss and use that therapy will be completely different. So even if the, if the paper leaflet continues to exist, how can we make sure that all the benefits that come with, the, uh, with EPI um, are also well, or, or that people with low technical literacy benefit equally as those who are yeah, digitally natives or just good with technology. And then, uh, Ken, I would uh, ask you about this first because maybe you have an idea how you know this could be promoted or how what, what features could be added to make it easier for people with low digital literacy. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, um, our view on this is um, you, you've got to test it. So if you imagine we've, we've done the, uh, we've, we've spoken <coughs> with a small pool of patients, eight, eight patients to get a deep understanding. And uh, to Steve's point, we've got patients of all different ages and demographics. Uh, wouldn't it be good if we could do a test with a few products? Uh, that this is what, something we would like to do here in Belgium, working with the, uh, with the Belgian, uh, associations in order to have
have a bigger pool of patients, let's say 500 or 1,000 patients, have the paper in the pack and have the digital and get their view on it. So uh, there's a lot of stereotypes like you think of, a, of an older person not wanting uh, an, e an EPI. There are old people that will be quite happy with it and there's young people who wouldn't necessarily look at it and flip because they've got more interesting lives. But there's other young people who would look at it. So instead of guessing, we would like to um, involve a bigger group of patients and get some feedback. Once we understand how big the non-digitally able or digitally willing population is, we can start to solve for that in a digital world towards paper removal, which would help with the environmental um, aspects of what's going on in the world, COP26, for example. But you can't do that one step. I, I like Juan's point that he made earlier about the flexible approach. So you could start with just one product, um, which wouldn't necessarily create burden in printing in a pharmacy, for example. That would be an obvious place. You know, when you get the drug dispensed, you, you could say, would you be willing to have the electronic one? Simple survey, yes or no. If you're in the high 90s of people accepting it, the problem for the non-digitally able might be small, but you've got to get the data and then uh, act accordingly. A stepwise approach, making sure that we're inclusive of, of all patients is, is absolutely vital. It's not acceptable to leave one patient without that product information. Thank you. Uh, would anybody like to add, maybe also in terms of well, could there, what, what could be communicated to patients more, or could there be trainings or these sort of things, but what, whatever would be there? Uh, yeah, maybe just to, to complement, I fully agree, and I like it a lot for the vision at the beginning, I think it's important that learn to not leave anybody, anybody behind. <laughs> That's why we do this complementarity. I think if, if you immediately impose um, everywhere electronic formats, there will be people who are left behind because there are people who are not there yet, they are not prepared. But the reality is that electronic tools are connected. Very often older people who maybe weren't so, weren't so familiarized with, ele with electronic uh, gadgets, etc. but now they are seeing the, the opportunity to maybe to be more connected with their families and, and of course to, to, to information. So I think the reality is that older people maybe they need support, but they are not, uh, they, they are embracing the new technology and they are becoming <laughs> great users of it. So uh, it's, it's repeating the same, but this flexibility is important. I think the process will happen. I think patient organizations, regulators, everybody has maybe a role to play, facilitating and let's say, ensuring that everyone does it in the right manner. But I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something which is gonna happen, whether we want it or not, it's just to ensure that it happens in the right manner. And, and keeping the paper as a complementary element until you know we, we are able to give evidence that the transfer, the, the transfer is complete, is maybe essential to ensure that everybody has access to the information. Given that. drugs, they use it less. So uh, at this point, there is need for awareness across different population, those who have low literacy, but those who have also low digital health literacy. And at this point, I'm coming back to where I am at the health advisory group, which means that there is need for consultation among different stakeholders to make sure that they, they work as a pioneers towards implementation of this electronic product information system. It's completely dark data. So, so you get your drug, it goes across the counter, that's it. We can do a survey in regards to finding out what people might be doing, which is a re reflection, a recall. With a digital tool, we may be able to actually
actually be able to analyze and see, really see. That will help organizations like one to make informed decisions as to what patients are actually needing from the supplementation. So I think that's one of the things, because, and then you begin to empower people to say, your, your interaction with this will allow people to make decisions. So help us to help yourselves, yeah? And that information comes back. As I say, we want to remove any of those dark data points, because at the moment, you're assuming that's what they do. We really don't know. We really don't know. So I think the digital will allow us, in some instances, to open up that information. Yeah? yeah. Can everybody hear, or should it be? Yeah. Uh, so we have an extra microphone, too. So my first question is, uh, for medical devices, uh, regulation uh, requires us to test uh, instruction manuals with users, the intended uh, user groups. And even for adult populations, FDA guidance tells us to provide them for each grade a healthy person. So my question is, is more general than, than um, um, the uh, patient leaflets. It's, uh, what, what about patient leaflets? Why, why isn't that the same? Why, why, don't, why don't we test uh, that they are understood uh, correctly with the intended patient population? Yeah, mm -hmm. happy to take that. Uh, actually, the legislation requires the leaflets to be tested before approval. So it's part of the process, they are tested. I think there are two elements. One is the content, another one is the format. Electronic product information doesn't affect the content. It's just the way it is provided. It increases the access. But whether the content is clear or not, I think this is another aspect of product information, which again needs to be addressed, is equally or even more important. But I think that's Let's say it, it, it is different to the way you want to present it, whether it's presented on paper or, like, or electronic. So the content of the, of the paper maybe is something that maybe needs to be discussed, it needs to be addressed in a, certain, in a different context because it is true, it needs to be uh, understood, it needs to be clear, it needs to be easy to understand by all the patients, etc. And yeah, it's an aspect that needs to be looked at. And I think it, whatever principles we want to apply here would apply as well to medical devices. Yeah, but the feedback is that patients don't understand. They want to have other vocabulary, uh, more user-friendly words. I mean, for medical devices, we're, we're not allowed to use uh, uh, words. We have to restrict words uh, with three syllables, for example. It's too complex. And we keep you know, simplifying the language, which is definitely not the case for uh, patient leaflets. Yeah, I think but, I, I fully agree. That feedback and the, 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 the current We're status quo person. is that many patients say even they don't read the leaflet because they don't understand, let's be flat. So this is something that needs to be addressed and needs to be improved. One of the recommendations we have is that we need to look at the content. We need to review the way package leaflets are written in order to improve them. I think yeah. the scope is there to have, to in time move to both of those solutions. So, so have the solution where the language needs to be addressed over time. But at the moment, it will be presented in the way, you know, it's presented in a more user-friendly, at least, manner. In, you will then begin to see how our individuals actually interact with it, actually. And then you can have a sort of top level and a higher level, lower level. So you will have patients who really want to get deep into the nitty gritty yeah, of, that, of that information. They should still be able to access that. There will be other maybe carers or uh, healthcare professionals who want to give that high level information. I think in time, both of those options will need to be provided. And something with a digital tool will allow you to have that. So you can go stepwise, deeper, and deeper, and deeper. Okay, and the second question was that, um, so the e um, patent leaflet would be, I don't know, the, the word was an extension to the paper leaflet, or? Uh, Complementary, so I was wondering uh, how close it needs to stay to the paper leaflet. It can be an enhancement. We're talking about videos. If you're talking about like perhaps more uh, inclusive language or easier to understand, can, can that be part of it, or is it just basically the same thing but in a different format? No, I think it's important. We are 
the idea here. For regulators, the product information is part of the authorization of the medicine. It's the information which is given when the medicine is authorized. The fact that it's electronic, it doesn't change the color of this content. So there are two elements. Again, there are two actions we want to work. One is to provide this content electronically, and another action is that this content can be improved in the way you have said. Maybe it can be written in a way which is easier to understand, it can be simplified, it can be written differently. This is something that at the moment we are not working because of resources and because it was prioritized to make the, the electronic form as a priority, but it's something that we need to address because we are aware that there is, let's say, a need to improve how the leaflets are written. So electronic will not change the content. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, shortly after review, there was this concern from the healthcare providers that, uh, okay, there is the content that we're not going to be changed, but there is also some complementary information <laughs> which might be considered a sort of um, marketing or um, promoting some sort of um, medicines for health and well-being, so where is the boundary, I would say, at this point, uh, we should be careful in, in, in setting this boundary, where is the content and where is the complementary information which uh, gives additional <coughs> advices on, on the medicines. The advisory group brought this forward as one of their main concerns, right? It was one of the conversations that was very early had with that group, okay, so it's like, not that the patients didn't bring this up. And when they were explained exactly why it had to go down that route and why it was, well, you know, why that's the logic and this could not be adapted, they came back and said, okay, so this is the first step. We want to make the first step. And the first step is can we begin to at least have our voice heard? So there are ways where you can build in to an application to allow comments content does not have to change, but you can have a feedback loop to say, please allow comment on this, so that comment and input from the public can be created as an option. So then regulators will say, okay, we're hearing an ask, a proactive ask from the public, maybe then we look to a way with our other industry partners and the public to address this concern. But I think we have another question. side effects and also when they have comorbidities and, and so many drugs and all the rest. But I'm going to let someone else take the answer for what that actually looks like. I'm sorry, because I don't hear what the question meant. Side effects. I think if there is a feedback loop, which I think makes a lot of sense if one has a digital leaflet that allows a feedback loop, then patients use that concerns they may have with their treatment, which might be relevant for pharmacovigilance. So is that considered? And of course, if it's considered, then I think it should address public health and public, public interest in the healthcare. How will it be resourced? Well, I think that's a, one of the critical aspects of product information, which is safety and, of course, its side effects etc. And uh, this is uh, part of the pharmacovia or safety information which is provided as part of every medicine. What the electronic formats will provide is a more interactive, interactive way to get access and to play with this information. Even for example, one example which has been given very often is that you are taking two medicines. If there are interaction between the two medicines and they are electronically provided, they will immediately so that if you as a patient are taking like five medicines and there are some interactions between them, some contraindications on them, this will be immediately highlighted. 
because everything is interconnected. So yes, I mean, definitely this, this is something which is going to be improved, and that's why we believe um, it will give a safer environment to patients providing this information in these, in these formats. Who is responsible to afford the information? So that, that that's very important because how is going to be anything this will not change the pharmacovian system which is at the moment in Europe. I think it should be exactly the same. On the contrary, it should be let's say better integrated, it should be easier because it, it will not change let's say the liability of it. The liability of the product usually remains within the company, within the developer. But I think the information will flow better because patients will be, let's say, more empowered or in principle. I suspect that they are, um, it's easier for them to report side effects that they, they may have. And these side effects will, is supposed, because it's electronic, it's faster, it's supposed to go directly to the companies and to the regulators. So if there is a need to change or to make any kind of warning, it would faster go to the product information, let's say. So the process is not changing, but it's more efficient. I hope I'm clear. The likelihood is the majority of patients at the moment are not even aware of where or how or what they should do in regards to reporting of a side effect. And so what we'd like to do is open up that possibility to have that conversation. I think... Uh, to comment on the technical aspect of that. Yeah, well, I've got, I've got something exciting to share with you. You know that barcode I was uh, sharing to power up that digital key? Um, one of the frustrations we've heard about reporting adverse events, it's, you, you've got to take a, quite a bit of information off the pack and put it in the adverse event report, which can be quite cumbersome. So it's possible to build in value through that scan where you can give the authorities the precise product from the scanner, the serial number, the batch, everything. That gathering of the information becomes less burdensome on the patient. It becomes faster to give it to the authorities. And when you think about data, so data by itself is useless. You need to have data which is accurate, okay? By scanning the barcode, you, the authorities can get accurate information. That allows them to make insights. So if you're seeing adverse if you're seeing a pattern with adverse events, then you can do something about it. Now that could be an update of the leaflet with uh, new warnings, or it could involve uh, policy decisions, or in, in the example that uh, Juan was giving with the COVID uh, vaccines, that could change shelf life, all kinds of different things. So I think the power of that digital key it could be used in, in a way which it isn't today to help authorities get uh, information more accurately faster and get better information on the patients. Thank you. Do you have any more comments? Yes, yeah, it's regarding the comment about the infrastructure. Just uh, the, the infrastructure is built. It's hope, we hope that by implementing this in the appropriate way, it will be more efficient because so far it's possible for all patients in all member states to report side effects already. Most of the time this is done sometimes through the websites of the national authorities and this is the reality is that it's not very often very friendly. Most of the patients are not aware this exists. And therefore, maybe there is an opportunity here to facilitate patients to report this maybe through apps in a few years time, which hopefully is more easier, is more, more efficient. Thank you, everybody. We're closing in towards the, towards the end. I'm sorry, we, we don't really have the time to take more questions because I want to have one more statement from, from each of you. Uh, but obviously, we're happy to continue the conversation during the coffee break. I think you're all still around. 
So please feel free to approach us and, and continue the conversation. Um, I would love to have like another hour to discuss this, but unfortunately we're yeah <laughs> running towards the end. But but what I what I really also wanted to know is um, if we think about EDI, and we've we've I've mentioned that before. Maybe it's in five years, maybe it's in ten years. But let's say let's say it's it's there in ten years. In ten years, ninety percent of the people are using EDI, and we have trainings for people how to use it. It is it is starting to replace um, paper leaflets. If we want to get to this point, um, from each of your perspectives, could you name one thing where you would say, this needs to be implemented now, right now at this point, whether it be in pharmacies, whether it be in care facilities and private practices, and what do patients need to know now? What would be the most important thing that needs to happen right now so that we can get there? And I would, uh, maybe why don't we start with you and then uh, lead up to see. Yeah, no, thank you. I think from our side, what and this is maybe our priority at the moment, what we want to work, and hopefully this is delivered by the end of next year, is to show a real case. Because this is maybe what is going to make clear what is meant by, by product information by authorities. It will allow the patients and all the parties to, to see how it looks and to play, and will allow then other providers to be able to take it and produce apps, and you know, the, 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 the possibilities are endless. So as soon as we have a real, EPI to showcase, this will maybe hopefully accelerate the whole implementation after this. Thank you. Irina? Thank you. Um, at the provider's point of view, I would say the most critical thing that should be done now is involvement. Uh, it should, we should make sure that uh, providers at any kind uh, that serve the populations, they should be involved from the beginning, from the written first draft of this policy to, to the implementation. And involvement, uh, I say also like this advisory group, many other groups should be uh, accelerated so it, they can facilitate the implementation. So involvement is the key word for me. Thank you. Ken, what do you think? So 10 years paperless, what needs to happen? One thing, it's easy for me, it's inclusion, must be solved. I don't think we need to restrict ourselves to thinking about we must leave it in the box. There's other avenues we could take, for example, print on, dis on dispense on a pharmacy, but that would only work if there's a high level of digital uptake. So I'm talking about the more advanced nations that uh, have high internet usage, high mobile devices usage, and start small, pick a product. Um, test it in a few pharmacies and get some real data to inform the path. But inclusion of every patient is a must. Value. Give and gain value. Demonstrate the value to the patients, why they should choose this and how it can be actually giving them value to be empowered for themselves. I, would, I think once you have that, then you'll have buy-in from individuals. So make it, a, make it a value-based tool. A tool to give back time to empower people who are patients. Thank you so much. Um, we are at the end of our time, but I, I hope everybody learned a lot about electronic product information. I hope you've gained an overview of the different perspectives on it. There are clearly many questions uh, which we're happy to continue to discuss and which you know should be discussed. We've seen there, there are many things that we need to advance on, not just on electronic product information, but in, in product information in general. Um, and all, this, all of this clearly needs to be done at the same time, so I think there is a lot to work on and a lot to discuss. So um, yeah, we're looking forward to, to talking to you about this topic further throughout the, the Congress and maybe at dinner tonight as well. Um, until then, I would like to thank all of our speakers. I think you've all done a wonderful job in giving us a different perspectives on electronic product information. I'd also like to uh, thank my colleague Juan, who's sitting in the background, who's been preparing this session with me, and of course, everybody who's been here and has been engaging. Thank you all very much. Coffee and cake downstairs, right? Okay, yeah, there's coffee. <laughs>